I've asked the Time for Truth team to answer this question. What do they want from the Lord in regard to their relationship with him? And these are the following answers. Donna. A closeness 24-7. A genuine desire and love for the Lord. To be focused on him. To really know him. And to be ready to see him. Callum. To be in the continual presence of the Lord. To feel always the holiness of the Lord. To be totally dependent on and have total trust in the Lord. To try and be spiritually minded always i.e. always looking at him, to bear the fruits of the Spirit, and to be ready to die, and to be ready to be dead to the world, knowing how much greater his presence is. Dion? To have a close relationship with him, and constant communication, obedience, unconditional love, devoted to please him in everything, to dedicate my life, and my thought life to be with wisdom and spiritual. And Latoya? To have a closeness to him, to really know him, to trust in him for all things and in all things, no matter what happens, what the consequence, to know his will, what I should be doing in my life, if there's anything else I should be doing for the Lord in my life, and to please him. Don't go away. Um, A question off the cuff. How are you going to attain that? would you give to those that are listening to this CD in regard to their walk with the Lord? With that in mind, turn please to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me, therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep. At the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, 
while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. That's a fantastic psalm. The reason I picked on that this evening is because for the last two nights and during the day I've pondered on verse 8, especially the last four, five words. I'll read the verse. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. The God of my life. I think that's a fantastic verse. Wonderful words that the Lord has written there. And this psalm is a great psalm when you know, we talk about doctrines and all this kind of thing, but this psalm is a great psalm because it, it gets you focused on what really matters in life, that you want to get to know the Lord Jesus the best you possibly can. And so I just want to walk through this, again, I've only done a few notes, just walk through this this evening and just for all of us to be challenged, may the Lord speak through his word to our hearts and that we can get something out of it that we crave, that we desire, that we want a deeper walk with the Lord. So verse 1, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And with regard to this verse, you know what it's like, it goes on verse 2, my soul thirsteth for God. You know what it's like to be thirsty. It's easy for us to quench our thirst because we have so much water around us, clean water, we just turn on the taps and we drink. Or we have, you know, your, your lemonade or whatever you drink, but you know, we're talking about water now. Natural water, you can just turn on, you have no problems of any health issues there, you just turn on the tap and you've got clean, running water. I wonder how often we thank the Lord that we have that. But I wonder if we have ever been really, really, really thirsty and how long that has lasted. You know, you play a sport, you know, we've played sport, you get so, you know, you, you sweat so much, you, you, you're putting so much effort in and you get really, really thirsty, but I wonder how thirsty you are compared to how thirsty some people are in the world where they have very little water and they have to go searching for it. But even as the heart, or the deer here, the heart here, panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I told you before that story of that uh, guy going on a holiday, I think it was to Scotland, and uh, he was w- walking across um, near, near a river where there's loads of like, rocks and trees and hills, lovely views. That He's walking towards the river and he saw a deer that had been shot and it, it was about six or eight feet away from the river. And it was trying to get to the river because it was bleeding and it was dying and it couldn't make... It was you know, crying out for thirst or crying out for water and it just couldn't make it. As the heart panteth after the water book, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. So my first question really is this. Being completely upfront and honest between you and the Lord, does your heart really pant after God? Do you really desire God? Do you really thirst after God? Like I said before, we're so good at talking the walk, but walking it is a different matter. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. How much of God do you really desire, do you want? My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Is that what you're like in your daily life? Or are these thoughts just things that we have read about in other people's lives? We talk about the David Brainards and the John Wesleys and people like that, the McShanes. Or is your soul like that? Do you really thirst after God? Or are you so wrapped up in this world that you've got one foot in heaven and one in the earth, in the world? My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? I wonder when the last time 
we were challenged in regard to reading these words and thinking, I've got to get my life sorted. I've really got to do something with my life because time is just going and I am wasting so much time. I need to get something sorted. Because day, you know, hours roll into the days and days into weeks and weeks into years and it just goes. And this year has flown. And we look back and we think, what have I done for the Lord? What, I, what am I in the Lord? As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall, sorry, when shall I come and appear before God? One day we're going to appear before God at the judgment seat of Christ if we're saved. I wonder if you'll be happy with your life and what you've done with it and the way you've lived when you stand before him. There is no way you can have a close relationship with Jesus Christ, with God, unless you are absolutely living in the word of God. No way. You cannot separate the word, capital W, from the word, small w. If you're going to have a a deep relationship with God, you need to be living in this book. Look what Job says in Job 23. Turn there, Job 23. Could you say these words that Job did? Job 23, verse 12. In fact, we'll go verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Are you being tried by the Lord? My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Listen to this. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He wanted the word of God, the words of God more than his necessary food to keep him alive. That's how much he desired God. Are we like that? It's a challenge, isn't it? Don't you think? As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And to think that if he comes, which we believe is very soon, if he comes, that's the end of our life on earth. So it is absolutely critical, imperative that we live close to God now, living in his word, doing his work, doing his will, and trying to get to know him the best we can before he comes. Verse 3. My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? My tears. I wonder, when was the last time we cried? I wonder what we cried for. What we cried about. <laughs> it was my uh, dad that used to say, that if I'd be crying for something silly when I was a child, he used to say things like, um, I'll give you something to cry about in a minute, if you heard that term. I wonder what we cried for. I've just listed down a few verses which I think are amazing in regard to tears. Look at these. Psalm 56, verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings, put down my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Isn't that interesting? Thou tellest my wanderings, put down my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? You know every time you cry, God sees that. God cares for you. It's horrible, isn't it? You're moved. When you see somebody crying, you're moved. I know that some of you have said this, that when you see somebody cry, you cry with them. You know, sometimes for, for a guy that we don't, because we're not as sensitive as some of you ladies, I say some of you ladies, no, 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 I'm joking. 
But we're not. As, as you know, men, we're, we're, perhaps we're hard on the exterior. You, you, know, you don't ni- know what kind of puppy we are inside. <laughs> but on the, we come across as these hard exterior blokes. But when somebody is crying, it moves you. you know, if, if, um, if I see Donna crying, it, you know, it, it cracks you up, it breaks you. It's the same. If you see uh, people crying, but you're, you're close to them. It does something. It's, 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 it's one of those things that even, you know, it can be a stranger crying that it really moves you within, with inside. Does that make sense? You know, you see it and you, you just, you want to put your arm around them and just look after them and, oh, it's, just, it's a horrible thing and you just want to care for them and love them. Um, even today, you know, when we were sitting in the, that cafe um, and we were just, we were just sitting there and I was looking at those three people, it just, it just moves you. And I'm just looking, and, just, and I, I just start feeling sorry for them, and, and uh, you know, oh, it's just, I can't explain it. I, I can't put it into words how I feel in those situations. But it moves me, it, moves, it hits me back, it gets me bad. You know, it gets me bad. Um, I had a cross-reference just on that. Uh, 2 Kings 20, verse 5, I just wanted to check that out. Oh yeah, lovely verse. Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. Isn't that lovely? I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. I have heard thy prayer. I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. That's 2 Kings 20, verse 5. A wonderful verse. So tears, we're looking at tears just for a second. What do you cry over? And um, it's very interesting in Psalm 56, as we've covered this in previous studies, thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? And we've said here that God has a bottle. God has a bottle for our tears. Every tear you've cried, it's like he's kept, he knows, he understands. That's a lovely thought. And in Job 14, 17, it says he has a bag for our transgressions. And in Malachi 3, 16, he says he has a book for our thoughts. A bottle for our tears, a bag for our transgressions, a book for our thoughts. Interesting, then. I was just thinking about this, you know. A bag for our transgressions. You can't see what's in a bag. It's interesting, isn't it? As if, you know, according to was it Hebrews 3.17, is it? Or 10.17. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The other day we were just joking and I was saying that, um, you know, there's 66 books in the Bible, but oftentimes, you know, and I'm as guilty as anybody, I, I have made it a 67th book, you know, in, when I'm dealing with people. You know, I sometimes have, I have to delve into the book of grudges. <laughs> yeah? And uh, you do, don't you? Sometimes you keep grudges with people, you know. He said that, she said that. I forgive you, but I'm never going <laughs> to... You know, I'm going to remember it for the rest of my life. Of course I forgive you, I just can't forget. And we have the book of grudges, and you, you, you like turn into that occasion, just so you feel good. <laughs> and we like that. But we're looking at tears. And I just thought those two verses, Psalm 56, 8, and that 2 Kings 20, verse 5, is it? No, they're lovely verses. Look at Job 16, 20. My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. And these are just wonderful verses. You know, if you're going through a hard time in life, and I've just you know, been speaking to somebody who's going through a real tough time, and um, even your, your friends, your friends can scorn you, your friends don't understand, you know, even the people that are closest to you, they don't understand what you're going through. Only God does. But mine eye poureth out tears unto God. You're crying unto God, and you're telling him, and he understands, and he listens, and he loves you, and he cares for you, and he wants to guide you and help you. And you just got to keep pouring out your life to him. Great verse. Psalm 6. Psalm 6, verse 6. I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. 
Now, it's also interesting that you can have a counterfeit. They call it crocodile tears. And tears in the scriptures, there's counterfeit, you know, it's, and it's um, associated with demonic activity at times in scripture, which is interesting also. Again, you could, you could go off at so many tangents with the, this study. But in regard to true tears, you know, and we're looking at our heart, we're looking at our own life, what kind of person we're like, you know, we've, we've started this meeting off the, this evening seeing, like, you know, where am I in God? What do I want out of God? You know, how deep do I um, want to get to know him? And how much commitment am I going to give him? You know, we'd, we're trying to establish where we are in the Lord. And we're now looking at why we cry. You know, we cry, that people cry for all kinds of different reasons, because they've lost, because they've won, disappointment, you know, excitement, pain. You know, there's loads of things why we cry for. Sympathy, attention, heartache, you know, sorrow, compassion. Oh, there's loads of sympathy, empathy, all these things. Why we cry. And I wonder what kind of person we are and whether we do cry for the right things for the right reasons. Psalm 39, verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. Now this this hit me for for six, just as I, I just brushed upon this this evening. Look at this. I am a stranger with thee. That's what I'm trying not to be with the Lord. I'm trying to get us to understand. I don't want to face the Lord as a stranger. You understand what I'm saying? Of course we're saved. We've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins forgiven. We're washed in his blood. We're a son of God, a child of God. Of course, we understand that. We've done that. But you can know about God or you can really know God. And I really want to know God. I want to get to know him. I want to understand about him and how he thinks and, you know, and what's important to him. And by getting to know God, you need to live a holy life. A life in his word and studying his word and reading his word and pondering and meditating upon it. Living in this book is the key. It is the key to getting to know the Lord, spending time with him, reading his word, and thinking about what you're reading and asking him to help you understand what you're reading. Psalm 126. Psalm 126. We often spend time on the wrong things in life. When we should be spending time with the Lord. And it shouldn't be, this shouldn't be a, a chore, a task. This should be a pleasure, a delight. Verse 5, 126 verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now this, this is a great verse for soul winning. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, beareth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know what he's doing? He's going out and he's sowing the seed of the word of God, but he's sowing it with his tears because he has such a compassion on the lost. And I wonder in our own lives what kind of compassion we have on the lost souls around us. Jesus dying for the ungodly and dying for sinners that hated him and didn't care. That's a massive thing. That's an unbelievable sacrifice. That's incredible sacrifice. You know, what kind of love have we for the people that we don't like? What kind of love do we have for the sinners out there that have no time for God? They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Are you crying over souls? When was the last time we ever did? Have we ever done that? You know, you have a relative in your family. It could be your wife, you know. Um, We were talking about even this evening about um, a guy that comes here and he's saved and his wife isn't, you know. And I wonder, I'll bet he, you know, he's on his knees praying to God, crying out to God, you know, shedding tears for his wife that she will get saved. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, the seed of the word of God, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Again, the illustrations that God gives to us in sowing the seed, the seed being the word of God. Um, Dee has sown some seeds recently in the garden, hasn't she? Um, And um, she was 
just making us laugh because her mum was telling her, like, you know, D, you need to, you know, sow the seeds, put the seeds down, you know, scatter them, and then, you know, cover them with earth, soil, and then water them. Well, of course, she, she, didn't, um, she didn't cover them with the earth. You know, she didn't listen to her mother. <laughs> Many times she hasn't listened to her mother. But, um, <laughs> so she sows these seeds, sows these seeds, and then the, the next minute, we're there, all in the house, thinking, oh, right, you know, we'll we look forward to this. The, the seeds are going to come up at the bottom of the garden, me and Donna are smiling, and thinking, oh, this will, this will be nice. She wanted a little patch, you know, that she wanted to go on and on about this patch. And, and Toy just said to her, oh, just give her the patch, you know. And so she sows these seeds. And, and then um, the next minute, we're in the house, lock the door, you know, you've got the glass doors, and you were looking there. And straight away, what's there? <laughs> Perched. <laughs> There's this robin, this little, <laughs> this little territorial robin. He's there, and he, and he's looking. He's got, it's like, hey, this is Christmas, you know. He's seeing all these seeds. And next minute, he's down there, and he's, in, <laughs> he's, he's getting all the man. Like he could hardly get off the ground. This fella, he thought, he thought, is this, this is his, um, this is his Christmas present. But we sow the seed, and you scatter the seed of the word of God. And so when you sow in tracts, getting back onto the serious part, when you sow in tracts, you know. Um, we should be, you know, everywhere you go, you should be sowing the seed of the Word of God. But it's our heart condition as well. Why are we doing it? Doing it out of duty? Or doing it because we love the Lord so much and we feel His heart's desire for the lost? 2 Peter 3 9 is it? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah, what's our heart like when we sow that seed? They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Luke eight, eleven says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. So tears are important. Tears are important in soul winning. What's your heart like? Mark 9, 24. Let's turn there. Mark 9, verse 24. Go 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And again, every verse we could break down, you could do your own sermon on this. This is incredible. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears. He cried out. He was so compassionate. And he had the Lord there and he stood. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When have we ever been in that situation, that position, where we are crying out because we want something so bad, we want a soul saved, whether it's our family member or it's a friend, you know, a colleague, whatever it is, whoever it is, we're crying out to God, Lord, you know, I believe, I believe they can get saved. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. There's a great song by Larnell Harris. That he sings that, those words, Lord I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You want, you know, the faith of the mustard seed, faith that can move mountains, but oftentimes, you know, we're so weak as people, as Christians. We're so weak. And we lack so much faith. And we should be coming to the Lord with tears. Lord I believe, help thou mine unbelief. I need Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And again, it comes back to this book. The strongest Christians you can find are the ones that are in the book, that are studying this book, that have a relationship with God and they are living daily in the book, morning, noon and night. And we're not reading enough and we're not pondering and meditating upon the scriptures enough and therefore we don't have that relationship that we read about often in scripture and that we read about in other people's lives that we desire in our own lives but we're not putting the time in with the Lord trying to get, into, trying to, get to know him Acts 10 sorry Acts 20 Acts 20 we're looking at tears why we cry and what for Acts 20 verse 19 
serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Every Christian ought to take that on board. And with many tears. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears. Verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. So we serve the Lord, we should walk in humility. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he shall raise thee up in it. We should serve the Lord in humility. Be humble people, not proud, arrogant, boastful, thinking that we are something when we are nothing, Galatians 6.3. Humility is the key also to walk in a godly life. You are nothing, I am nothing, and God is everything. And with many tears. I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. How do we come across? How do you warn people with tears? You're crying out for them. You know, can't you understand that I, I mean it with all my heart? There is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. Nearly through, just with these few verses in regard to tears. 2 Corinthians 2, turn there. 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye, sh- that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Fantastic verse, man alive, look at this. And again, the way we write, you know, you write emails and letters or, or you know, whatever you do, books, tracts, whatever you write. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. How do you write? You know, I haven't a good relationship, as you know, with my family. My mother has passed away and my dad, you know, I just don't get on with. And it's taken me years and years and years to write a letter to him. You know, day after day after day I was thinking about how do I get through to him? He's unsaved. He has no interest in God or Christianity or the word of God. He has no interest. He's just a sad, lonely old man in his early 80s now. Lived a life of rebellion towards God. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Oh, I just could pour out all now, but... I want to keep on the straight now on this, this sermon if I can. And it took me years. And then I, um, you know, and I, it's like you sometimes have, you know, I say maybe it would be good if I let go, but you have to, you know, I, I sometimes feel like you could just cry. Just cry. I think it would be better to let go and not bottle it up. Let the God, God bottle it up, the tears. But you just open up. And so I did, and I wrote a letter to him. And you could, you know, I could write a book to him in regard to family life and problems and solutions and, you know, what's, what's best for us. How can we mediate and, you know, come back, all this stuff. Right? And so you write and you open up your heart, which I did. And I think, I think I've written two letters. I wonder if you've ever written letters and to whom. And when you wrote those letters, how much from the heart was it? Is it just wrote? Is it just parrot fashion? Is it just out of duty? How do you write? Do you open up? you write from your heart for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears that's amazing verses amazing words much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you I'm trying to pour out my heart onto paper to try and get through to you if there was somebody unsaved in your family and you, you try, it'd be just good just to pray about it read the word of God pray about it and ask God to give you the words to put onto that paper, to send to that person. Pouring out your heart in words, your your thoughts, you know, whether it's to your dad who isn't saved or to your mum or your cousins, whoever it it is. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. You know, it all does come back to motive. 
how and why we do certain things. What's your motive? Like I said before, we're all good talkers. We all talk so good as if everything's going well when things are, you know, and we're thinking, yeah, yeah, this is great. We're such good talkers. We pretend. All of us, we're, we're all the same. We pretend. And yet living the life is so difficult at times. We're actors. Actresses. And then, finishing up in regard to tears, these wonderful verses, Revelation 7:17. 7, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There is coming a day, Revelation 21 verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. There is coming a day when God shall wipe away all our tears. We won't cry again. You won't need to cry. You won't have to suffer sorrow or death, bereavement or pain. For the former things are passed away. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's a lovely picture as well. God shall wipe away all tears. You know when a a child is crying and the the mum gets the handkerchief out and she's wiping away the tears. Oh, come on. You can feel like God's doing that to you. He loves his children. And he has that compassion that he loves you so much he's wiping away all tears. No more tears. No more tears. That day is coming. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Those words always affect me as well. Pour out. I remember listening to that song, isn't it, um, by Steph McLeod, Running on Empty. Pour out. There are times in your life where you do feel like you're running on empty. You've poured out everything. It feels as if you've got nothing more to give. You've given everything. I wonder if you've ever been in that situation before. In Psalm 62, verse 8, Psalm 62, verse 8, the Bible says, Trust in Him at all times. In all times. Trust in Him at all times. Even when you don't understand. Ye people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Pour out your heart before him. Have you? Do you know what it it means to pour out your heart and soul before God? We said before that in any relationship where you intend to go deep, whether it's a wife and husband or best friends, whatever it is, There is vulnerability because you give, you open up. But you open up to a degree where if the other person opens up and you have that, you know, that, that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, mutual, like, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Thanks for your help tonight. Um, but you're totally, you know, one person opens up and then the other person, and you'll go so far, you know, and then, then both of you perhaps will say, okay, we're going to break down all the barriers now and let's just open up and love one another. And you can have that in a husband and wife, which you should be, but also in a friendship relationship where you should be, you know, opening up if you want to go deep. You know, and with God, you, you know, perhaps with, with all of us, you hold back that little bit. You know, you have the David and Jonathan relationships in Scripture. And maybe, you know, maybe you've got a friend or a close friend that you open up to, but you go to a certain degree, perhaps. But with God, you should be totally exposed. You see, when you stand before God, you're naked. You're t- just like, you know, Adam was in, in the start. You're, you're totally open, exposed, naked before him. And our relationship should be like that. We should be pouring out our soul, pouring out our heart continually to God. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. 
I'd gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. You know, there's a joy when you go to church together, when we meet together, we burn together, we fellowship one with another, because God is in the centre. God is the focus of everything in our lives, and especially in our in the church. He's he is the head of the church. Of course, he should be. Verse five: Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise Him for the help of his countenance and you've got a very similar verse in verse 11 why art thou cast down on my soul why art thou disquieted within me hope thou in God for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God we do get cast down at times there's a great verse in fact if you read verse 6 there oh my God my soul is cast down within me therefore I remember thee from the land of Jordan from the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. In 1 Samuel 30, turn there, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 30. <coughs> 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And David was greatly distressed. We've been there, we've been cast down and distressed. For the people spake of stoning him. They wanted to kill him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons, for his daughters. It seemed like everyone was against him. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And sometimes we're like that. Sometimes when you feel all alone in life, you feel like everybody, you know, we all did there, we feel like everybody's against you. We all have those feelings at times. Nobody understands. Nobody cares. And so all we can do is just encourage ourselves in the Lord, in God. Lord, you understand. You're with me. I'm, I feel like I'm going through this alone. But you understand, Lord, so please help me through this situation, this problem that I've got. Isn't it? Man would swallow me up, it says in Scripture. And that's what man does. You know, the, the news is saturated with people catching other people out. People destroying other people's lives. All killings and murders and deceit and lies and cheats. Everywhere you look. You know, and it's, everybody's against everyone. You know, you make out your friends, but if you can get one up on somebody to gain something for you or your family, people do it. Dog eat dog, they say. You know, it's a vicious world. David was in that situation where everybody was against him and he encouraged himself in the Lord. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore I remember thee from the land of Jordan and, from, and, and, and of the Hermonites and from the, the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep. I love that verse. Do you know, I, I think... In fact, look at the, the whole of this verse. Deep calleth unto deep, at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. You know, this is a very, very deep verse. This, there is something in this verse. In this verse, right, deep calleth unto deep, at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. This may sound mad, but I'm telling you it's there. In that verse... There is the crucifixion. In that verse, there is judgment. In that verse, there is hell. In that verse, you have got the Lord Jesus Christ bearing the sin of the world and taking the judgment that was put upon him for he has made sin for us, going to hell on our behalf. That verse is deep. No wonder you've got those words, deep calleth unto deep. And when you, that's what the scriptures are amazing, that they're just incredible, because you can read it, and you can look at it from this point of view, deep calls unto deep, you know, the, the deepest part of you, crying out to God, trying to get that depth within your relationship with God. That nobody perhaps will understand, but you're there, and you're, you're just totally exposed to him, you know, and you're just trying to get as close to him as you possibly can. Deep calleth unto deep, you know, how would you describe depth, a depth of a relationship, the depth of the relationship that you have with the Lord? How do you describe that? What, you know, what, how would you put that into, on, into words or on paper? Deep calls unto work. At the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. 
Let me give you just some things, just for you to think about. Because this, this verse would need some expounding. This verse you would need to spend some time on. But let me just give you a few things that are quite incredible about this verse. Turn to the book of Jonah. <coughs> Jonah is a fascinating book as well. Oh, they all are. (laughs) It is amazing. Jonah 2, verse... Let's just read. Jonah is a a picture of the the Lord going, descending into hell. uh, uh, Jonah 1, verse 17, we'll just read in. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Isn't that interesting? Three days and three nights... And then you've got in Matthew 12, verse 40, haven't you? For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, Jonah is a type of Jesus Christ. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, he cried, yep, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Jesus descended into hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Look at verse 3. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. That's the resurrection. You see, here, and again, we've done a study on Jonah, and we're not going to be able to expound this tonight, but here, Jesus Christ is pictured. He he, he has made sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he's made sin for us. He descends into hell, according to the Acts. What is it, Acts 2, is it? Where are we looking, Acts to 16, is it? 27? Yeah, oh yeah, it's Psalm 16, 10 or something, is it? We're talking about descending to hell. And, um, and Matthew 12, 40, you want to look at as well. But here, here he's, um, it's a picture of him going to hell. He goes down, um, verse 5, the waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Weeds wrapped about his head? the crown of thorns. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars. Hell has bars on it, in it. Was about me forever, yet thou brought up my life from corruption. Thou shalt not see thy holy one see corruption. Remember that verse in Acts? O Lord my God. It's a picture of the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the book of Jonah. And the verse we're looking at, touching upon verse 3, for thou hast cast me into the deep, deep calleth unto deep, at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows have gone over me. In the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me, all thy billows and thy waves pressed over me. This is hell. This is judgment. Can you see it? It's it's amazing. There is hell and there is judgment. And look at this. I'm talking about the waves waves and billows in regard to judgment also. Right? Amazing. Look at these verses. 2 Samuel. Turn there. 2 Samuel. Verse, uh, chapter 22, 2 Samuel 22. This book is deep. 2 Samuel 22, verse 5. When the waves of what? Water? No. The waves of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The waves of death compassed me? All through the Old Testament, you've got pictures and types, and you've got like words like this, the waves of death compass me. Waves and billows in regard to judgment. I'm going to show you that in a second. All through the Old Testament, and this is a picture of what Jesus Christ ha- will have to go through in order to save us. We keep saying this, but it's as if he is on every page of Scripture, even when he's not mentioned there. We've said from Genesis to Revelation, the bloodline. It's a living book. That's why it's quick and it's powerful and there's no other book like it. This book is deep. Let me give you another one. Psalm 88. And I'm only touching the service here. Psalm 88. 
Verse 7. Thy wrath, listen carefully, thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Thy wrath lieth, lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. The waves and billows through scripture sometimes talk about judgment. It's deeper than just the water. In this verse that we are looking at, Psalm 42, and we're looking at it from a devotional standpoint, really, tonight. We want to get to know God. But you can see the doctrine, the deep, deep, deep doctrine that lies beneath the superficial thing that we are looking at in regard to deep calls unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. You see, the Bible talks about seven baptisms. And when we talk about... Um, Again, it's very interesting in picture and type because when they go through the Red Sea and the wall of water is, above, is, is by the side of them, yeah? Remember when we looked at this, the wall of water by the side of them and you've got a cloud being led by a cloud by day you know, and the fire by night, you've got the clouds going over them. You know what you've got? You've got a baptism because you're being immersed in water, sides and above. And um, it's very interesting because when you look at, they call it in the mystery of the deep, that's a very deep study, the mystery of the deep and the top being frozen. And we said there is water above the heavens, above the first heaven, above the second heaven, there is water. Above the second heaven, there is water. In between the third and the second heaven, there is water. Do you know what that is? It's like a baptism, it's like we are being immersed in water. It, 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 all through scripture and all through creation it points to Jesus Christ it points to the gospel the gospel in the stars you know we talk about the astronomy and so on but the gospel the, the lion of the tribe of Judah the lion Leo the lion you know the virgin it's picture all in type the fingerprints of God are everywhere it's fascinating the waves and the billows that roll over, it talks about in scripture, roll over. it's the judgment falling upon the Son because he has made sin for us. We'll never understand what he went through. You talk about a sacrifice, Jesus Christ is the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, a sweet-smelling savour unto God, made sin for us, took our sin and died in our place and goes to hell and was judged and rose again the third day, all because he loved us. Deep calleth unto deep. I want a deep relationship with Jesus Christ, the deepest I can possibly get. I want to get to know him the best I possibly can with the time that I have now. And when I see him at the rapture, when I see him face to face, and I fall down at his feet, I don't want to be like a stranger that I never knew him. And so all throughout the day, we're trying to talk to him, and throughout the day we're trying to you know, read the scriptures at some point even if you can get a verse a paragraph you know, a few verses, a chapter, whatever just saturate yourself in the word of God thinking and pondering upon verses because this, is, this book guides us through this life because this, this, this world is shot through and we need to be led by the Lord but again, all I'm doing is whetting your appetite on verse 7. If you want to go deep, that's a, verse, that's a good verse to get into. You look up waves and billows in Scripture and, and um, look up baptism. You know, it says, um, doesn't it, in the book of Matthew, uh, the Pentecostal will say about the, the baptism of fire. What is it? Um, where is it? Matthew. Just, baptism, uh, Matthew chapter 3. Verse 11, I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, John the Baptist speaking, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost. Yes, we're baptised with, he, he baptises with the Holy Ghost, yeah? We're baptised into the body of Christ. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon you and he could leave you. Now that we are baptised into the body of Christ and the Trinity lives within us. So the Holy Spirit is within us. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. We cannot lose him now. We cannot lose our salvation once we are in Christ. That is it. Fantastic. But look at this, you know, the Pentecostals talk about, well, we want the baptism of fire. But you don't, because look at it. He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
you would think that is synonymous, that, you know, Holy Ghost, oh, we want to be baptised with the Holy Ghost and with fire, but you don't, because it, it determines, it defines what the fire is. Look, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The last thing you ever want to do is you want to pray for the baptism of fire. That is not what you want to pray for. So all I'm showing you there is that there are different baptisms. We said there's seven baptisms. There is one where we're saying even going through the uh, Red Sea with the water above you, it's a type of baptism there. You've got the baptism of fire there, that's just two. Let alone the baptism of water being baptised into the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians is it 12, 14. You've got to rightly divide this book. That's why it's so exciting because it, you know, there's so much in it. You, know, you, could just, you could skirt over this verse, verse 7, Deep called the thunder deep, but the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows have gone over me. Oh, that's a nice little verse. But that is, that's a deep verse. Well, we move on. That's just wetting your appetite. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness. This is the verse that really led me to all this this evening. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and then night his song shall be with me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. Throughout the day, day his loving kindness. And you're thinking about his loving kindness and, and you're just dwelling upon God and you're just having fellowship with God and communion with God. Wonderful. Thinking about God, reading his word, listening to Christian music, being challenged, you know, you want to change your character. We, we, we talk about that. I want to change my character to be more like him. I don't want to be so harsh, so bitter. I don't want bitterness in my life. You know, I just spoke to somebody this week and he's bitter because, you know, something's happened in his life and he's lost something and somebody and then something else has happened in his life and he's lost something else and, and you become bitter and you become hard and you walk away. You decide, I don't want this anymore. I'm turning away from the Lord. I'm turning away from the That's the worst thing you could ever do. It's in times where you lose things that you need to turn to the Lord more. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me. You know, we sing, we, we said this before, but Christians, you know, we're so different. We're not better, of course, we keep saying that, but we're so different to Muslims. You know, we could, we could give you hymn book after hymn book after hymn book that are, that are songs that have been written about the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and sing these songs. You know, we talk about the Redemption Hymnal, and you sing all these great songs. Isn't it mad that you get these so-called super-spiritual, amillennial, Calvinistic, reformed people that say, oh no, we only sing the Psalms, we only sing the Psalms. And there's a guy down in London, he's a lovely bloke, but he is mad as a hatter, honestly. And he's, he's, he's oh, I won't even bother, but he's, um, and he, we, oh, we won't sing any of those oh, John Wesley hymns. No, it's like a sin. And it's just absolutely insane, these people that say this. You know, and he, we only sing the Psalms, and when you, when you hear him sing the Psalms, you wish he didn't. <laughs> oh, dear. But the, these, these redemption hymns, and we, uh, hymn after hymn are singing to the glory of God. Fantastic. And then you've got the Muslims. What, what are they singing? Oh, I, better, I better leave it there, otherwise I just have to go on to the members section. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's saying, no, no, leave it there. Okay, okay, I'll leave it. But you understand what I'm saying? You, just just get, send me, post me a, um, a Muslim hymn book. You know what I mean? It's, show, me, show me the thousands of hymns they, they've written towards Allah. They don't sing. They're not happy. Happy blowing themselves up and, you know, and killing all this. That's, that's not love. We sing because we're joyous. We, you know, we've had a great day, the loving kindness in the daytime, and the night his song shall be with me. And you see, you're, you're meditating, you're pondering, you're, you know, you've got a song in your heart, you've got a joy, a joy in your step. And you lay down on the pillow thinking, what a great day it is, I've been with the Lord today. The Lord looks after me, we had a great day. You look back and you think, Lord, I've had a great day today. We had a good day today. You know, and you look back and you think, this is fantastic. In life, thank you, Lord. Even though it's very, very hard in, in, in the world, yet the Lord carries you through. In the world, the Bible says, in the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We're overcomers. There's a Pentecostal saying, we're overcomers. But we are the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and the night his song shall be with me and my prayer. I love this. I just, this has really stood out to me this week. 
and my prayer unto the God of my life. Fantastic. I, when we showed you, you know, when I read that to you, um, and you said, oh, that's good, you know, straight away, Donald was like, I've got to have that, I've got to have that underlined. <laughs> and we want that, the, the God of my life. And that's what he is. He's the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock. I was going to do a study, we've run out completely out of time tonight, but in regard to the God of my rock, you want to get Jesus Christ is God, the booklet, and look at page nine in regard to the rock. You want to put that down if you want to do a cross-reference on that, by the way. And um, just put those initials if you want to, in regard to Jesus Christ is God, page nine. And you've got the study of the rock there. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? That would be a great cross-reference with Psalm 51. You want to read Psalm 51 alongside that verse, verse 10. And you want to read Psalm 38 in regard to that. Great, great, great Psalms that will draw you closer to the Lord. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. That's exactly what it is. We hope in God. Can't wait. Isn't it funny that the rapture is called the blessed hope? Hoping in God. We're looking for the blessed hope, the rapture. For I, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. It's very personal, isn't it? He's my God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is my God. I love him. I committed my life to him. May the 4th, 1989. 25 years ago, he was, I made him my God. The God of my life. You could actually say that, I suppose. You're there. On May the 4th, 1989, the Lord became the God of my life. Great psalm. All we've done. Just skipped over things. Just took out a few thoughts. But there's a lot in there. And every single verse, every passage of scripture goes deep and goes deeper and deeper. And you can get you can you can lose yourself in this book. That's what I love. It's an adventure. This book is an adventure. You know, it's a history book, it's a prophetical book, it's a poetry book, it's a doctrinal book, it's the book of life. Bible, basic instruction before leaving earth. I love that. But it's, it's everything. Everything you want is in this book. And we read it and it gets you thinking. And we just need to spend more time in it. Just a few thoughts for this evening just to get us into the scriptures and pondering upon God. What do we want from God? We want a deeper relationship with Him. A deeper call of to deep. We want to get to know Him the best we can before we see Him face to face, which could be any time now.